Hello, everybody. We might um, make a start now that it is two past 12. If you could just flick to the next slide. Um, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for attending the talk today. My name is Elizabeth Ross and I am a researcher here in the Centre of Animal Science at Corfi. My research interests focus on microbiome um, traits in tropical agriculture, especially cattle. And um, I, it gives me really great pleasure to host this session today because it aligns so closely with the work that we're undertaking here. Uh, if you could flick to the next slide, Mel. I just want to start with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today, and I pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Next slide. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping um, pieces of information. The seminar today will run from midday 12 until 1 p.m. After the seminar is finished, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. When you do have questions, if you could use the Q&A button and not the chat button, that would be great. And then the questions will be read out to the speaker. Next slide, please. So with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Melanie Hess, who's going to be presenting today on incorporating microbiomes for prediction of methane in New Zealand sheep. Dr. Melanie Hess is a research associate professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the USA. She completed her PhD in animal breeding and genetics at Iowa State University with Dr. Gloria Garrick, and she subsequently did a postdoc at Ag Research in New Zealand where she established a workflow for rumen microbial profiling using restriction enzyme reduced representation sequencing and incorporated those profiles into predictions for environmentally and economically important traits in sheep. She's currently working on the genomics of complicated traits in beef cattle and her interests are focused on modeling complex data in a way that can be practically used in industry. Melanie's work aligns very closely with a number of initiatives that we're undertaking here at Coffee, including the CRC for Net Zero Emissions proposal, several large MLA funded projects that are using uh, microbiomes to predict methane, as well as our work on cattle um, complicated tra uh, trait predictions. With that, I want to say thank you, Melanie, for taking the time to share her work with us today. And now I will hand over to Melanie um, to give her presentation. Thanks, Melanie. Hi, thanks very much, Liz, for uh, inviting me to come and talk to you all today. Um, and thank you all for attending this presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about incorporating microbiomes for prediction of methane in New Zealand sheep. And this is work that I carried out during my postdoc at Ag Research. As common with these types of presentations, it was not an independent effort. Um, I had a huge team behind me that helped ensure that this project um, came to fruition. Um, So New Zealand has a large agricultural sector, as does Australia. And in 2020, there was 50% um, of New Zealand's gross greenhouse gas emissions were um, attributable to agriculture. And 35% of this can be attributed to enteric fermentation, which is the digestion of feed by ruminants, primarily sheep and cattle. In Australia, this is just 10%, but it's still a really large chunk of the um, nation's greenhouse gas emissions for both countries. Now, with, our, with the Paris Agreement, um, we're obligated to try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And so the question is, how can we reduce these emissions when, um, when we need agriculture um, for our national GDP. So some people might just say, reduce the livestock numbers. 
However, ruminant livestock are a major source of protein for humans and play an important role in feeding the world. So in New Zealand, more than 99% of the sheep meat we produce is produced for export. And so that's a huge earner for the country and a huge supplier of food um, for international export. So we need a way to reduce methane emissions to meet our Paris Agreement targets while maintaining production. So the first step of doing this is to actu actually measure the methane that is being measured, uh, emitted by the sheep uh, at the moment. So the first approach we use for this is respiration chambers. And these ones are in Palmerston North in the middle of the North Island in New Zealand. Um, the sheep go into these chambers for about 24 hours and they're all of their gas emissions are measured um, throughout that 24 hour period. And they're fed in these chambers. And they, um, so this gives us a really accurate picture of the amount of gas that is emitted by these sheep during that 24 hour period. Um, this is a really uh, expensive method um, to measure the methane emissions. And so it's not really going to be feasible to push large numbers of animals um, through these respiration chambers. So another option is um, portable accumulation chambers, um, which were developed. And um, here are some that are present at Woodlands in the bottom of the South Island in New Zealand. These ones, um, the sheep go in there for about an hour. Um, so it's a much shorter time frame, And they go in there when they're between two to four hours off feed. Um, we've got really high correlations between the methane emissions uh, and the respiration chambers and the portable accumulation chambers or the pack chambers. Um, we want to be able to go out on farm and um, measure sheep from a variety of different environments and that's obviously not possible with um, portable accumulations that are in one place. Um, so we've put them on the back of a pack trailer and you can see Suzanne Rowe here um, standing on our pack trailer and that's gone out um, and is currently going to measure methane emissions on farms all over New Zealand and that's been really successful. So the next question here is, okay, we've measured the methane. Is it even possible to select animals that have reduced methane emissions? Is it a heritable trait? And so about a decade ago, over a decade ago, um, ag research developed the methane yield selection lines. And you can see there's four progenitor flocks here. Um, and then the high methane selection lines in green and the low methane selection lines in purple. And you can see that there's about a 1% change in methane yield each year. Um, the other question we had was if we do select for methane yield, then how does that influence all of the other production traits? Because we don't want to take a huge hit to production just to reduce methane um, a little bit. And the great thing we found was that breeding for low methane may result in sheep that are economically favorable. And that's even before any potential carbon costs that the government might um, bring in um, and also um, economic or other environmental benefits. So we have our livestock and we know that they emit methane and we know that it's a heritable trait from our selection lines. But then the question is, um, can we incorporate some of the information on the microbes in the rumen, who are the ones that digest that feed, um, to be able to um, improve our prediction accuracy of methane and potentially reduce methane emissions even further. 
Um, so in the talk today, um, first I'm going to tell you about a method we've developed for high throughput metagenome sequencing of rumen samples. So our goal was to be able to process thousands of um, metagenome samples um, really quickly um, so that they can be used for selection purposes. Um, and this involved developing the lab processing steps, a sequencing approach, as well as a bioinformatic processing pipeline. Next, once we've got those metagenome profiles, can we identify some key um, factors that are influencing those profiles? Um, in particular, we're interested in identifying a methane um, selection line signal. And um, third, I'll look at incorporating metagenome profiles into prediction equations. And we'll do that um, both within diet and age, and also across diet and age to see whether those predictions are likely to be stable across time. And also look at across country predictions. So first of all, the process for generating the metagenome profiles. And um, for this talk, I'll use microbial or metagenome profiles pretty interchangeably. So the first step is obviously obtaining the rumen sample. So we did this using stomach intubation. Um, we put that sample immediately on dry ice and then stored it at minus 20. Uh, we then put it in the freeze dryer um, for around seven to 10 days um, and finished off the, this stage by um, a grinding step. So this was to homogenize the sample into a fine powder for DNA extraction. And this is important so that if we take a small subsample um, that it's actually rep for sequencing, then it's actually representative of the sample as a whole. And this was um, one of the most time consuming parts of the process. Um, most other microbiome studies, they only look at, you know, up to a couple hundred samples in most cases. And so this was a step that we needed to make really high throughput. Um, and we managed to do that using these magic bullets, uh, which are typically used to make smoothies. Um, but we adap adapted the cup um, and used the blades that came with the magic bullet um, and really homogenized that sample. And we're able to do at least 10 samples at a time. Um, and they only took a few seconds each. So that was, um, that was a, a large part of my postdoc was getting that process up and going. Um, so with the um, traditional sequencing methodologies, there were two main approaches. Um, so first of all, um, to capture the metagenome, there's whole genome shotgun. And this has the potential to capture any or all DNA within the sample and generates large amounts of data, so millions of reads per sample. While this is a great approach and really information rich, those millions of reads per sample take a long time to process, particularly when you're dealing with thousands of samples. On the other hand, there's 16S rRNA gene sequencing, also known as 16S. And this is a lot higher throughput than whole genome shotgun. You typically get around, um, you know, a few tens of thousands of reads per sample. And it targets only one gene and, the, and only captures prokaryotes. And so it's higher throughput, but there might be other organisms within the um, rumen that will help us with our methane predictions. So what we needed was a high throughput method to capture metagenomes for accurate predictions. So the approach we used was um, restriction enzyme reduced representation sequencing. And this is the sequencing approach that's regularly used um, for genotyping based sequencing or GBS. Um, so first we extract the DNA from our sample. We then digest the DNA using a restriction enzyme, and in our case, it's PS PST1. We then um, ligate barcode oligos to link each sequence with the correct sample. 
um, and then um, put all the samples together into one library. The, we then undergo a fragment size selection step and then the uh, libraries are put on the sequencer. So we used a Illumina HiSeq 2500 for our sequencing and had 384 samples per lane. And we did a variety of um, simulations to end up with this number. We could theoretically put up to a thousand samples per lane, um, but due to the lab processes that wasn't particularly feasible. So we've um, stuck with 384 samples. Uh, we then go through the, um, once we get this sequences, they go through a demultiplexing and trimming QC approach, um, which is using GBSX and Cutadapt. And we then put it through our reference-based pipeline. So our reference-based pipeline uses BLAST, where we compare the sequences against the Hungate 1000 collection, which is a collection of about 400 uh, rumen microbial um, genome sequences. Um, we get the results here. So there's the results for one, um, one read, and it's mapped to three different genome assemblies of the Prevotella genus. We then assign um, the sequences at the genus level using the Megan algorithm. Um, and so as you can see here, this um, read A has been assigned to the genus Prevotella. And we then obtain our metagenome profile, which is a table of counts um, with each row is a different sample and each column is a different genus. With this approach, we get between usually 10 to 30 percent of reads that are mapping um, to um, that profile. Well, this is great. Um, it means there's still a lot of other sequences that we're not capturing using this approach. So we also developed a reference-free approach. And this approach identifies common tags. So a tag in this case is the first 65 base pairs of the read. And the common tags are those present in at least 25% of samples um, within your group. Um, there's an example of a few tags here. Um, we then go through and count the occurrence of each of those tags for each of the samples. This approach here, we're capturing more like 40 to 60% of the reads in each sample, so it's a lot more information rich. Um, with the reference-based pipeline, we end up with a metagenome profile with about 60 columns representing each of the unique um, genera in the Hungate 1000 collection. Um, whereas with the reference-free approach, we can get easily a couple of hundred um, tags that um, we're um, capturing within that profile. So once we developed that approach, um, we then set uh, um, got set on um, sequencing all of the samples. So um, we sequenced just under four and a half thousand samples for this analysis, uh, and this was spread across New Zealand and Australian samples, um, the bulk of which were New Zealand samples. Um, there's eight different groups there, seven from New Zealand and one Australian, and these groups were separated um, based on the diet, so whether the animal grazed pasture, um, was on, fed lucerne pellets, maintenance pellets, um, and then the Australian animals were fed a chaffed lucerne and cereal hay diet. The age of the animals was either lamb or adult, so we decided an adult was um, those sheep that were older than 15 months of age. And then a long or a short time off feed, where short was two to four hours and long was 15 to 16 hours. Most of these animals were fed ad lib, um, but there were a couple of groups that were fed on a restricted diet. Looking at the number of samples and the number of sheep, we can see in most cases, um, each sheep just had one sample per group. 
um, but there were a couple of groups where they had two. Um, also, if you look down the columns at the totals, um, you can see that there were some sheep that were captured across multiple groups. So now that we've um, got the sample sequence, we wanted to have a look and see um, what the relationships were between the samples. So do we pick up the expected relationships? And here expected, um, we hope to see a methane selection line signal coming through, um, given that we know that we've got the methane selection lines as one of the flocks in our study. Um, and we know that ex animals with extreme um, methane emissions uh, do have um, different microbiome profiles. So on the left here, we have the reference-based results, and on the right, the reference-free results. And on the top, is um, the samples are colored based on the group that they're in. And on the bottom, they're colored based on methane selection line. So you can see in um, neither case for the reference-based or the reference-free, are they separating by methane selection line. However, they are separating very clearly by group. Um, and the reference-based ones, those groups are clustered a lot more closely together than they are for the reference-free. So we wanted to kind of adjust out these group effects to see whether we could um, then see a methane selection line coming through. And to do this, we normalized each of the columns within cohort, where a cohort was the set of animals that were collected um, at the same time during the same couple of days from the same flock that were the same age. So every animal within a cohort was within the same group in our study, but the groups would have multiple cohorts within them. And so we see here with the reference-based approach that cohort adjustment gets rid of the structure that we've been seeing by group. Uh, and then when we look at the methane selection lines, we see a signal coming through where the high methane selection lines tend to be on the left and the low tend to be on the right. With the reference-free approach, um, we don't quite get completely get rid of those group effects. And this is because some of the tags that are present, um, they're only present within some of the groups. So when we do that adjustment, it doesn't fully get rid of those effects. Um, however, if you look at, at it colored by methane selection line, we're still seeing a pattern here where the low methane selection line animals are clustering more towards the, the top and the high methane selection line animal or samples are um, clustering down the bottom. Um, so <clears throat> to answer the question, do we pick up the expected relationships between samples? Um, yes, we do. We find the main influences on the profiles are from the environmental factors, such as diet, time off feed, and age at time of sample collection. And once we remove the cohort effects, we see the signal of methane selection line coming through. We also found that the differences between groups are more extreme for the reference-free approach than the reference-based approach, um, which we, we would expect just because the reference-free approach um, captures more of the information, more of the um, sequences from the um, microbiomes. So now that we've identified that um, methane selection line signal within our samples, um, we can look and see whether we can improve the production of methane and other traits by incorporating these rumen metagenome profiles into our prediction equations. So the data set we used for this was a subset of the rumen samples, um, and it was those collected a short time off feed. 
which are the ones that um, PAC methane data was collected for. Um, we have a few traits here. Um, so we've got um, methane emissions, so CH4, methane ratio, which is CH4 ratio, and that's the ratio of methane to methane plus CO2. Um, this is um, kind of a proxy for methane yields. And um, <clears throat> rounding off the methane related traits is carbon dioxide. Um, some of these animals were also run through um, a feed intake facility. So we have residual feed intake on a lucerne pellet diet um, in here as well. For our models, um, we um, you fit the, um, for our Ys, we have the traits I just mentioned. Um, we fit some fixed effects, and those are the same for each of these traits. And those are birth rear rank, age of dam, and birth date deviation. And we also fit either um, the genetics uh, or the microbes or both. And for the microbes, we fit a, a microbial relationship matrix um, with the cohort adjusted metagenome profiles. Um, to evaluate the performance of the different models, um, we look at the percent of the phenotypic variance explained. So this is the heritability for the genetic component and what's termed the microbiability for the microbial component. Um, we also look at the prediction accuracy, which we calculated using cross-fold validation, which with each, each of our different um, folds being a different cohort. The, um, the prediction accuracy was calculated as the correlation between the adjusted phenotype and the breeding value or the microbial value. Um, so first looking at the variance explained by the relationship matrix. Um, so the variance explained by the reference free MRM, which is the darker colors, is um, clearly larger than the reference-based MRMs, which are the lighter colors. Um, something else to note is that the microbiability estimates for CO2 are all zero. And the G plus M variance explained is all coming from that genetic component. And so this is consistent with our CO2 emissions largely being driven by factors other than feed digestion in the rumen. Um, so we wouldn't really expect um, the microbiome to be able to um, improve prediction of CO2. Um, there's potentially some inflation of the variance explained by the MRM, particularly for the reference free approach, as we're kind of approaching 100% um, of the variance explained um, using some of those matrices. And then looking at prediction accuracy, um, we have a much greater prediction accuracy when we incorporate um, the microbial metagenome. Pro um, profiles for these methane traits. And um, consistent with the variance explained, we have no predictive ability of CO2 using the microbiome. Um, so the, um, our estimates of the variance explained by the MRM and the prediction accuracy using the MRM are pretty consistent with studies using 16S profiles when we use the reference-based approach. And you can see that we're quite clearly um, getting better results when we use our reference-free approach. So moving forward, I'll just focus on the reference-free approach. Um, and I'll also not talk any more about CO2. Um, so just to point out, these were the methane traits in the um, grass lamb set. And so next I'll talk about the methane traits in the grass adults. And we see a really similar pattern here um, in terms of the variance explained and the prediction accuracy um, when we include the um, microbiome information. And so although predicting methane emissions at the same time we collect the sample is of interest, 
Um, it's also important to consider how stable those predictions are across time. And in particular, um, can we use a LAM metagenome profile to predict what the methane emissions will be um, in that individual as an adult? And so the answer is yes, we can. So we don't see quite the same improvement in accuracy as when we collect samples at the same time the phenotype is measured, but we do see an improvement in accuracy when incorporating metagenome profiles as a LAM. Another main question is, um, whether we're able to predict using metagenome profiles collected on a different diet. So for that, I'll um, use the example trait of residual feed intake. And just a reminder, this was collected um, on the Lucerne lamb um, data set. And um, we see that um, we again get improvement in prediction accuracy um, when we've got the, when we incorporate the microbiome profiles, um, but when we use the profiles on the grass lambs or the grass adults, we don't get quite the same jump in prediction accuracy um, as we do when we use the sample on the same diet. Although looking at just the prediction accuracy of the MRM, we still have reasonable prediction accuracy um, across diets, although it's not quite as high as um, genetics alone. So can we improve prediction accuracy by incorporating microbiomes? And we can for some traits. And um, we got the results we expected, particularly in the case of CO2 not being predictive. Um, using a reference-free approach is more informative than a reference-based approach, which again is what we expected giving, giving, given that we're capturing um, more of the sequences within that um, profile. Um, we were able to predict across age and across diet. In particular, of importance, we can use lamb microbiomes to predict methane emissions in adult sheep. However, we are explaining 100% of the variance in some traits, which is not realistic and indicative that some of these estimates might be inflated. So next, we wanted to see whether we could um, predict across countries. So can we use microbiomes and methane measurements from another country to improve prediction accuracy if we have a smaller data set? So for this, um, we looked at the New Zealand samples and methane um, values that I've just been talking about, the grass lamb, grass adult, and lucerne lamb, and um, an Australian data set. And this data set was about 300 animals that had um, methane, uh, microbiomes, and genomic information available. And we fit similar models to what we did previously, where we fit um, either genomics only, um, microbiome only, or both. And <clears throat> the, there were two main comparisons we did. So the first was using only New Zealand data to predict the Australian phenotypes. And in that case, we trained only using the grass lamb samples, only the grass adult, only the lucerne lamb, or the combination of all of those. The second question we had was, um, can we combine the New Zealand and the Australian samples to improve prediction accuracy in the Australian samples? So we had training using just the Australian samples um, as a baseline, and then Australian plus the New Zealand data set um, as well. Um, for this, again, we used um, cross-fold validation with each um, validation set being a, co a different cohort. So here are the results for using New Zealand sheep to predict methane emissions in Australian sheep. And 
as you can see, the breeding values were mostly positive and the highest accuracy was from the breeding values estimated using the full New Zealand data set and the full model. Most um, this was important because it's, or this was expected because it had the most information behind those um, methane measurements. So it had up to three um, methane records per um, individual, one collected on the grass lamb data set, one on the grass adult data set, and one in the lucerne lamb data set. When we look at the microbial value estimates in blue, um, we can see that these were only positive when training on the lambs fed lucerne pellets. Um, the GMV, so genetics plus microbial values, um, were also mostly negative, um, except when training on the lucerne lamb data. So, um, and, and all of the um, lucerne lamb accuracies were positive, even though they were lowly positive. So the lucerne lamb diet was most similar to the chaff lucerne that the Australian animals were fed. So it's likely that the drivers of methane emissions in the Australian sheep and the lucerne lamb um, data set were the most similar. And so for the um, GL, GA and New Zealand training sets, um, fitting a model including metagenome information tended to improve the accuracy of the breeding value estimate um, beyond the model just accounting for genomic information. Um, so that's essentially um, capturing more of the environmental variation helps to improve the accuracy of the um, genomic component. Um, and finally, for this slide, I just wanted to point out that there are quite big differences in the accuracy of the BV and the model just fitting genomics. And there were essentially the same animals um, in each of the grass lamb, grass adult, and lucerne lamb data sets. Um, the lucerne lamb was actually the smallest data set. Um, but that shows that the, the difference in prediction accuracy is largely being driven by the differences in the methane phenotype on each of those data sets. And um, so the, the slides looking at the accuracy in predicting the Australian data set when using the combined New Zealand and Australian samples. And so the first thing that's probably apparent is that the there's no results for the full model in the Australian animals. And that's because there were only about 300 animals total within that data set. Um, and especially once you split that into um, cross-validation sets, um, that model just couldn't run. Um, there wasn't enough data behind it to, to fit that sort of model. Um, next, we see that the prediction accuracies um, are much higher than when we trained on only the New Zealand data set. So those were kind of um, 0.1 to 0.2, whereas here we're getting prediction accuracies in the realm of 0.4 to 0.6. So adding that Australian information definitely improves the prediction accuracy. Um, the highest Accuracies were observed for the GMV model fitting the um, Australian and the lucerne lamb um, data for the training set, um, followed by the microbial value estimated for genotyped animals um, when training on just the Australian data set. Um, so we are still getting pretty high predictions just within that um, Australian data set, even though um, there's only 300 animals in it. Um, and the models fitting both the genomic and microbial effects gave higher accuracies than the models fitting just genomic or just microbial relationships for the models trained on the Australian plus lucerne lamb and the Australian plus New Zealand data. 
Accuracy estimates were higher for all components when augmenting the Australian data set with just the Lucerne LAM data set rather than the full New Zealand data set. So that shows us that it's important um, to, to match the diet of um, the animals if you are doing these across country predictions. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of can we predict across country, um, it is possible even when genetic linkages are not strong. So those New Zealand and Australian animals were quite different breed compositions. Um, however, care needs to be taken in matching the diets as closely as possible. Prediction accuracies of Australian sheep methane emissions were higher when training on data collected on Australian sheep than training on only New Zealand sheep. Um, and more complex models were able to be run on the combined Australian and Lucerne lamb New Zealand data set, um, which was able to improve prediction accuracy. So that comes to the end of most of the um, results that I'm going to talk about. So we managed to um, find a successful way of doing high throughput sequencing on um, the uh, rumen samples. We managed to show that we were picking up the methane selection line signal within those um, metagenome profiles. And we're then able to use those profiles to improve prediction accuracy, um, both within a time point and across an animal's lifetime. So then the question is, what next? So the most exciting thing for me, at least, is that um, we found an approach for no more freeze drying and grinding. Um, so we looked at a variety of different solutions that we can use. Um, and this research is um, published at the link shown below there. And um, we found that uh, um, TNX2 or GHX2, two solutions that we looked at, did a pretty good job um, and were pretty gave pretty correlated um, microbiome profiles um, compared to our, um, our freeze drying and grinding approach, which we call the GRC method. Um, and this, um, these PCA plots that you can see on the right, um, the top right one um, is colored by the sample preservation approach. And um, the bottom left here is um, split by um, round one or round two samples. So they're samples collected on the same animals two weeks apart. Um, and we can see that we get um, arguably clearer separation um, between round one and round two than we do um, using these different sample preservation methods. There are, there are a variety of other um, analyses that we've done in that paper to show that um, the TNX2 is a really good substitute for the GRC method. And we've even been able to subsequently um, show that we can use um, GRC um, training data set to predict um, microbial profiles from the TNX um, that were sequenced using TNX2 with reasonable accuracy. And um, the next steps for ag research are more samples. Um, so in particular, um, of interest is samples collected in a commercial setting. Um, the results I have showed you today are from three different flocks, but those are all ag research, um, research flocks. And so it was of great importance that we could show that um, these results can um, also be applied in a commercial setting. And we're seeing a prediction accuracy of about 0.3 when we um, predict in those commercial flocks. And that's pretty similar to what we were seeing um, in our analyses that I've presented today. Um, they're also processing samples from New Zealand and a variety of other countries, um, a variety of species, um, sheep, cattle, deer, goats. 
Um, another question is, can oral swabs be used instead of rumen samples, as these are easier and more efficient to collect? Um, it will just simplify that whole process and make it a lot more appealing to collect um, microbiome samples um, on these animals for prediction. Um, and just a plug for the restriction enzyme reduced representation sequencing, um, this approach can be used on a variety of other types of samples too to get microbial profiles, um, for example, water samples, soil samples. Um, and if you're interested in using um, restriction enzyme reduced representation sequencing on your own samples, um, then contact Suzanne Rowe, who's um, in charge of all of that. And finally, um, more samples means more data and the potential for exploring alternative models that may further improve prediction accuracy and um, kind of delve into what's really happening and what microbes um, might be playing the biggest roles um, for some of these traits. And with that, I would like to thank all of the funders that made this uh, research possible, um, as well as you all for listening today and uh, willing to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was really great. I would ask anybody that does have a question to pop it into that Q&A box not into the chat box so that we can see it um, and read it out. While we're waiting for that, Melanie, I just wanted to quickly ask, what's your opinion on these sort of more targeted methods versus something like shotgun sequencing? Um, and what are the sort of implications for choosing different methods? Sure. Um <clears throat> So while I haven't personally had experience with the shotgun sequencing, um, we tried a variety of different enzyme combinations um, when we were first developing this approach. And so PST1, um, you capture on average about half a percent of the genome of each of the microbes, um, at least within the Hungate 1000. Um, and with a another restriction enzyme APEK1, we um, capture more like one and a half or two percent. And when we were running the reference free approach on that one, um, we ended up capturing a lot more tags, but then each tag was at a lower depth, which meant that we um, we weren't as confident in each of the calls independently. And so then when we um, ran associations with the APEK1 um, microbial profiles, we weren't able to get the same um, strength of um, correlations between methane emissions um, and the metagenome profiles. Um, if you can imagine that... Um, that whole metagenome sequencing is then another step removed from there because you could potentially capture any part of those genomes. Um, then it could, there, there are additional, um, I guess, complications with that as to how you bin your reads and things like that. Um, so it's, it's another step that's needed rather than just the um, kind of reference-free approach that we've got here is very simple and straightforward because if you capture, you know, the same microbe twice, it's most likely that you're capturing the same region and you can just assign it to a tag. Thank you very much. We do have some yeah. questions in the Q&A that I'll read out to you as well. Uh, so... The first question is um, from an anonymous attendee. He <laughs> says, in the first part of your talk, you mentioned sheep with low emissions are also more economically viable. Which economically viable traits are linked to low emissions? Okay, so um, this was research from our group that I wasn't um, immediately involved in, but... Um, they tend to be leaner sheep and they're not 
um, there were not a lot of um, traits that were um, significantly different. So I guess maybe a better way of saying it is they're unlikely to be, um, you know, have a negative economic impact by um, selecting for methane emissions or methane yield. Excellent. It's nice to know that we can preserve our, the economics of our production systems while we're still yeah. dealing with this issue. Yeah, um, definitely. A question from Ben Hayes. He says, hi, Melanie, terrific talk. To make the predictions a bit, a bit less sensitive to diet, could you subtract the species that are particularly influenced by diet from the prediction? You could do this by removing species that are all, that are most different between lucerne and grass. Um, yes, it's definitely an approach. Um, we've um, looked at a variety of, so, yeah, we've looked at a variety of different ways of kind of cutting down the um, the different taxa that are um, being used. So within um, the results that I showed you today, and sorry, I think I skipped over this, is when we used, say, the grass lamb microbiome profiles, um, we generated our set of tags within that group. So it would have, um, all of the tags would have been at, at least 25% prevalence within that overall group. Um, so we have done that. Um, there's other ways that you can also um, kind of cluster tags or filter tags. Um, as you can imagine, there, there's an, yeah, numerous ways that that can be done. And um, it will take a while to kind of investigate all of them. Another question from Ben um, is, did you look at the species or genera that were most important in the prediction? So for example, did you back solve the MBLAP equation um, to get sort of individual um, sort of OTU effects? Um, no, we haven't done that at this stage. Anybody else um, has a question, do just pop it into the chat. Uh, but it looks like that's it for now. So I might wrap it up there and just say to Melanie, thank you so much um, for spending the time to come and talk to us today and to share um, all of this work that you've, you've been doing over the past several years. If anybody wants to contact Melanie, they can always reach out to her. And if we could just flip to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to announce the, um, the next coffee seminar. So next week there will not be a seminar due to Tropag. But after that, we have Janie presenting on tissue culture and a central toolkit for crop improvement and productivity. So please join us on November 8th at midday um, to hear her talk about her recent work. Thank you very much for attending. And um, if you haven't already, please do sign up to the emailing list. You can see the way to connect to that server on your screen now or reach out to Craig Hardner, who's the Science Seminar Committee Coordinator. Thank you again, Melanie, and thank you everybody for attending and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.